text this morning is found in uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. And we're going to be looking at uh, just one verse. One verse that happened to um, catch my eye. I was trying to decide whether to include this in last week's or uh, to do something separate on it, but doing something separate won out. Uh, uh, not the least of which reason, you'll see that this one verse is actually a paragraph in your Bible if it happens to be divided into paragraphs because it is a subject in and of itself. Sometimes it's hard to deal with more than one subject. In a sermon, you kind of lose track of the first subject or the second subject as you look at multiple subjects. So we're going to look at, at this one this morning. So let me read for you this verse as we begin already given you a bit of a heads up on what it actually is talking about. But it does show us, again, the importance of singing praises to the Lord, something that was actually just open for us uh, this past Wednesday as we are considering the subject, Sing to the Lord a New Song, and as we're learning new songs, we're going to be wanting to introduce those into the worship uh, that we share together here. Mark chapter 14, verse 26, this is what we read. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, just to get a running start of this, I want to back up. I haven't been doing this recently, but I thought it would be helpful for us at this particular juncture. We saw that after Jesus had given to Judas a very clear warning, and Judas certainly knew that he was referring to him when he said, Woe to that man! by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Jesus meaning, of course, because of the eternity of hell that he was going to have to suffer for rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ and actually being the one who betray him. After Judas received that warning, he still left to betray Jesus Christ. Now, we know the Bible says that the Lord leaves everyone to the freedom of their own will but they're certainly bound by their nature to do what it is they want to do. And Judas wanted money. That's why he went out and sold Jesus out to Jesus' enemies. He sold him out even though he knew the cost would be very high. Now again, I want this to be a reminder to those of you who do not know the Lord. You need to remember that if the Lord does not change your heart, you're gonna continue to go the wrong direction as well. You are going to uh, sell the Lord Jesus out. You're going to deny him. You're going to go willingly to hell unless the Lord changes your heart. This is not a decision that you can make. God has to change you. All you can do really is pray and ask God to do that, and that's what you need to do. Pray that he would give you the grace to repent and believe a grace he did not give to Judas and a grace that he doesn't give to everyone. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Now we saw also that after Judas left, that Jesus instituted the supper, the Lord's Supper. And now the disciples understood a little bit more about what the Passover really meant. They understood something more too of the love that our Lord Jesus Christ actually had for them because he was about to go to the cross. And he was about to suffer hell on the cross. The very thing that Judas was going to suffer for all eternity, Jesus was going to suffer on behalf of his people so that they would not have to suffer, but that they might be able to go to heaven. Now, if you're trusting the Lord this morning, this is the love that Jesus also has for you. He suffered hell in your place so that you might be set free for all eternity and that you might actually enter into heaven which is much better than we can even imagine, a world full of perfect love. And this is the primary reason why you ought to give to the Lord your whole self, your whole heart, your whole life, and love him with everything that you have within you to love him with, that, you know, to devote yourself to him and to his glory. May the Lord grant each of us the grace to do that. Now, they also understood from what Jesus said that Jesus was going to rise again from the dead. He wasn't going to stay dead. And they knew that not only because of what Jesus said earlier in his ministry. A number of times he said, son of man's going to be betrayed. He's going to be killed at the hands of wicked men. And he's going to be in the heart of the earth like uh, Jonah was for three days and three nights. But he's going to rise again. For some reason, 
They just didn't get it. But at the table, he reminded them again that he was going to drink of the fruit of the vine with them, new in the kingdom of heaven, that he wasn't going to remain dead. And that they too were not only going to see him again, but they were going to enjoy the blessings of heaven with him as they sat at his table in heaven and also joined with him in ruling and reigning over the nations. Now again, we saw that this is true of you as well if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and you are serving him from the heart. That's the evidence that you are the Lord's is when you can do that from the heart. You too are going to join him at his table when your brief life on this earth is over, and life really is brief. Since that's real, since you're really going to be there, really going to enjoy these things, really going to rule and reign with Jesus because he really did lay his life down for you on the cross, you should let those things stir your heart and motivate you to push forward in your service for the Lord and not serve him half-heartedly, not give him just one day a week or just an hour out of that day a week or just fleeting thoughts uh, throughout the week, but do everything that you do for his glory and honor. Every decision you make, make that decision for his glory and his praise, not because it's merely something you want to do. That's how we often make our decisions, but the love of Christ calls us to make decisions that are honoring to him in everything that we do. Well, now that the supper had ended, Jesus and his disciples did that which was customary to do. It says here they sang a hymn. Actually, we know from Jewish custom that they did more than just sing one hymn. And actually, in the Greek, it just simply says they sang praises. It doesn't say they sang a hymn as though it was just one. But they sang praises to the Lord. Actually, what they sang was a group of psalms called the Hallel. And if you think about the word Hallel and the word Hallelujah, you get an idea of what it means. The Hallel simply means praise. And in this case, it's referring to a specific group of psalms, Psalm 113 through 118, which they would customarily sing at the conclusion of the Passover. That's what Jesus and his disciples were doing. Now, this morning, I want us to look at the fact that that's very interesting that these psalms would be sung on this occasion and also interesting in light of the fact of what Jesus was about to do. First of all, because of what these psalms actually contain regarding the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were pointing forward to him. But secondly, because of what Jesus was about to face. Oftentimes when we're, when we're distressed over something, the last thing we feel like doing is singing. And yet, the Lord Jesus with his disciples, we can understand why the disciples may do this, but Jesus knew fully what was about to happen. Jesus takes the time to worship the Lord through singing these praises. So let's consider these two things for a few moments. Now, first of all, Jesus and the disciples sang psalms that spoke of what Jesus was about to do for his people. Now, I think you know by now that there's a great deal about Jesus Christ in the Psalms. And most, if not all, of the Psalms actually address who Jesus was going to be and what it is he was going to do. So it shouldn't surprise us that these particular Psalms that they were singing at the Passover would be pointing to the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I thought it might be helpful, although I don't have time to read all of these psalms, just to give you an overview of what they actually say. So you can see uh, just how interesting it is that they would sing these particular psalms at the Passover. Now, Psalm 113 is a call to praise the Lord, to worship him, uh, declaring that he is worthy to be worshiped by the whole earth from the rising of the sun to its setting the name of the Lord is to be praised. That doesn't mean just from sun up to sundown, but that means wherever the sun travels from the distant lands where it rises to the distant lands where it sets, God should be praised by the whole earth and he should be praised forever because of who he is and because of the great mercies that he shows. And certainly what greater mercy could the Lord have shown than sending his son into the world to die for sinful man, in order that we may have forgiveness simply by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
This is a mercy that was going to be offered to the entire world, and this psalm looks forward to the time when that would actually take place. The world already owed God praise for his kindness and mercy that he showers upon them every single day, but particularly in sending his son into the world to die for sinful man that all who hear the gospel might have that opportunity to be saved. Psalm 114 looks back at the redemption of the Lord of his people out of Egypt and what he did for them in parting the Red Sea, in parting the Jordan, in overcoming the nations and planting them in that land. And then that very interesting uh, comment where he says he provided water for them out of the rock in the wilderness. And you know that Exodus is a grand picture of the redemption of our Lord, of his people, that he would later accomplish through his son. He may have brought you know, his people Israel out of Egypt, out of the iron furnace, out of the house of slavery, but he has brought us out of the uh, kingdom of darkness out of Satan's house, out of our bondage and slavery to sin, and under the condemnation of hell. He has delivered us, and he has provided for us also a rock, one that has been struck, one from which water flows, the water of life, and that is, of course, the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus came into the world, in order to die, that he might redeem us from Satan, and that he might provide for us this living water. Psalm 115 reminds Israel that they should worship and trust the Lord because he alone is the true God. All the other gods of the earth are idols. They are simply pieces of wood or stone. And the psalmist says that those who put their trust in those idols are going to become like them who neither hear nor speak. They are going to die. Those who trust in the Lord will be blessed. Of course, our Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to reveal the true God. He came into the world to establish a relationship between us and the true God so that we could receive his blessings. And the only way that can take place is through the blood of the cross. Jesus came into the world to die on the cross that he might reconcile us to God. And there is no other religion under heaven that can do that. There is no other God that can save you because all of those gods do not exist. They are false gods. There is only one true and living God. There is only one way of salvation, and Jesus has provided it. Psalm 116 is an expression of love to the Lord because he's a God who hears the prayers of his people and who answers those prayers. He is the one who delivers from death, the one who delivers from Sheol, the one who delivers from the grave, the one who preserves the life of his people. And as you read that psalm, how can you not think about the fact that God was the one who delivered his own son from death, the one who delivered his son from Sheol, from the grave, through the resurrection. There was one who trusted God, and God delivered him from the grave. And those who put their trust in him are also delivered. Psalm 117 calls on the nations to praise the Lord looking again forward to that time when the Lord would bring them to himself through the work of his son. That was the one we used for our call to worship. And then Psalm 118 contains perhaps one of the most explicit prophecies regarding the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and what would happen because of that. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As Jesus sang this psalm, how could he not know that he was about to be rejected? I mean, he already knew Judas was going to betray him. Judas was going to tell the leaders of Israel where they could find Jesus so they could arrest him secretly so they wouldn't have to worry about what the people would think about that. He was going to be rejected by the leaders of Israel. It was going to lead to his torture and to his crucifixion to his death, but the Lord was going to raise him up again and make him to be the cornerstone of a new temple made of living stones that would offer up praise to the Lord forever, basically the church. And the day of his resurrection would become the day upon which his church would gather together from that time forward to offer up praise and thanksgiving to him because of the work that his father has done through him. 
all these psalms really do talk about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the psalms that they sang, and you can see why they sang them. Because they speak so clearly of what Jesus was about to do and the results it would bring. The whole earth would give glory to God for the work of redemption that he was going to accomplish through his son and the living water that he was going to offer and pour out upon his people in doing what really the only true and living God could do, and that is bring salvation. Salvation from death, salvation from hell, salvation from the grave. And the whole world would ultimately praise him for this blessing that he would bring about through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, that the church from that time forward would meet on that particular day when Jesus rose again from the dead in order to give him the praise that, as his, that is his due. That's what all these psalms are talking about. Again, interesting that they would sing them. But the fact that those things are true is the reason why we're meeting here today. The reason why we've gathered together is to worship this risen Lord who has brought about this blessing to us. As our brother uh, Dick was praying this morning, you know, we could be doing what the rest of the world is doing today. We could be on our way to the beach. We could be on our way to the mountains. We could be on our way to some amusement park to have fun. But the Lord had mercy on us. He chose us. He changed our hearts. He brought us together to do that which is infinitely more important than that fleeting fun that one might have on this particular day. He has brought us to worship the one who has laid down his life to save us from hell. I hope you see that as significant. That's very significant. Sometimes we hear it so much, we think, oh, well, I've heard that before. It's no big deal. If you were to spend a moment in hell, just, just a minute in hell, you would see what a big deal it is. You would have spent all eternity there, but for God's mercy. And that is what they were singing about at the conclusion of the Passover, which they now see was a grand picture of what Jesus Christ was about to do and how he would bring them life. Now, it's interesting they sang these psalms <clears throat> for that reason. But it's also interesting that they sang these psalms for a second reason, and that is because of what Jesus was about to face. Now, as I mentioned before, we often sing when our state of mind and our circumstances are actually quite a bit different than this. We sing praises to God when we see that God has given us reasons to praise him usually when we're happy about certain things that have come into our life. And we certainly try to focus on these things when we gather together to worship the Lord. We read what the Lord has done and what he continues to do and how we ought to be thankful. And in light of that, we offer up praises to God. And certainly, that's what we should do. James tells us in James 5.13, Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. The Lord would have us to give him thanks in everything. But how often do you think about worshiping the Lord and singing his praises when you are faced with a difficult situation? When it seems like the hand of the Lord has turned against you? Well, this is what the Lord actually wants you and me to do, to sing his praises at all times and in all circumstances. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, the Lord has not left us without examples. We have several examples in Scripture. Think about this one. After the Lord had allowed Satan to go to Job and to take away all his possessions, kill all of his, actually, take away all of his livestock, take away all of his servants, and then finally to kill all of his children. Job fell to the ground and he worshipped the Lord. Now, why did Job worship the Lord under these circumstances? Well, as you read the book of Job, you find out it's because Job realized that he didn't deserve all the good things that he had. God could give those things to whomever he wills, and he happened to give them to Job to enjoy. He knew they, they came purely from God's grace, which means he did not deserve them. God gave him something there he didn't deserve. And God, at the same time, had every right to take those things away from him. 
if he deemed that to be best for him. And of course, regardless of what happened, the Lord is God, and the Lord was Job's God, so Job owed him worship, whether he had these blessings or didn't have these blessings. Paul and Silas were arrested for preaching the gospel. They, they had their, their shirts stripped from them publicly, and they were beaten severely. And then they were thrown into a prison, and their feet fastened in the stocks. And we read in Scripture, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. Now, why were they doing that? Well, they were doing that for the same reason the disciples, after they had been arrested and flogged by the council, uh, went out rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to suffer for the one who had suffered for them. You know, one thing the Apostle Paul gloried in were all the scars that he actually received uh, for preaching the gospel. You know, we, we don't want to hear a bad word. We don't want to be rejected. We certainly don't want to be beaten. We don't want to be arrested or imprisoned. Uh, if you read 2 Corinthians, Paul actually gives us a catalog of all the things that happened to him. His body must have looked like a mess. And instead of looking at his body, you know, just having low self-esteem because he had all these wounds and scars on him, he, he looked at them and blessed God that he had been counted worthy to suffer in his place. He writes in Galatians 6, 17, from now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. I receive these for Jesus, and I'm happy about it. He, he wrote to the Philippians in Philippians 1, 29 and 30, for to you it has been granted, this is something that God actually has blessed them with, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. I mean, this is a blessing which the Lord actually grants to his people that they might experience sufferings and conflict. And again, giving Paul, giving uh, the disciples, giving Paul and Silas, giving the disciples collectively a reason to rejoice and to worship God. Now, Jesus, knowing that his time had come for him to lay down his life, to receive the guilt of his people in his own body, and to suffer hell on the cross for them, sang hymns with his disciples before leaving to pray at the Mount of Olives. And why did he do that? Well, it's because he knew that his sufferings would not only free his people and result in glory and honor for himself and give glory and honor to his father in satisfying his justice, but also that he would receive the people for whom he was laying down his life. Because of all these things, he was praising God for all the good he was going to bring. Remember what the author to the Hebrews says regarding Jesus in Hebrews 12 too. Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why was Jesus singing praises before he was going to be beaten mercilessly and hung on a cross and then suffer God's wrath on the cross? It wasn't because he was looking forward to the pain and the agony of all that was ahead of him. He actually sweat blood because of that. But he was looking forward to the joy that was set before him, the good things that God was going to bring through this. Now the point is this, that if you are the Lord's, you always have reason to praise Him, no matter how difficult things get for you. If the Lord takes away all your possessions, if you lose some of your loved ones, or your health begins to fail, you can be thankful like Job that you had them to begin with because you didn't deserve those things. None of us deserve these things. God gives them purely out of His grace. And God has the right to take them away whenever He wills, anytime He pleases. But realizing that as His children, that He only takes these things away from us when He knows that it will be for our good, then we can always be sure that what He has planned and what we're going through is better for us. It's better for us not to have these things than to have them. If the Lord ordains that you should suffer for his namesake, 
maybe in sharing the gospel or taking a stand for some righteous principle, then you can be thankful that God has counted you worthy to suffer for the one who suffered for you, to suffer for Jesus. Knowing that, that whatever God brings into your life, that he always is going to bring some good out of it, that he's going to work it together for good, should give you plenty of reasons to worship the Lord. You know, it's for these reasons that the Lord actually tells us in Scripture something that I think the evangelical church isn't really ready to hear. And that is that it's good that the Lord afflicts us. Do you know that? That's what the Bible says. It's good that we're afflicted. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, verse 71, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. In verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. And then a passage that really struck me from Isaiah, in Isaiah 26, verse 9, he writes this, at night, my soul longs for you. Indeed, my spirit within me seeks you diligently. For when the earth experiences your judgments, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Now, I think that we think that, that we ought to pray that things go well with us all the time. You know, just smooth sailing, plenty of everything, you know, feel good, uh, plenty of health, have all that I need financially, you know, spiritually, everything's going well. I hope you realize that, that when things go well, that's when we're most likely to fall into sin. That's when we're most likely to go after the world, is when things go well. But when is it that we're most likely to seek the Lord? It's when we are afflicted, when the Lord brings difficult times, when He disciplines us, and by the way, discipline doesn't mean, you know, it's not always corrective for some bad kind of behavior, but all of his discipline is meant to teach us. It teaches us righteousness, as we've already seen. The psalmist say in Psalm 119, it was good that I was afflicted that I may learn your ways. Author to the Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 that when we are afflicted, we should make straight paths for our feet so that the limb which is lame would not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. In other words, that things don't get worse, but better. God afflicts us so that we will seek Him, so that we will learn righteousness, so that we will become more like Him, so that we won't go after the world and be destroyed along with the rest of the world. We should actually expect affliction. We shouldn't expect things to go well. I mean, the idea that just come to Christ and everything's going to be smooth sailing from here on out you know it's just the opposite. When you become a Christian, that's when things begin going against you. I mean, there's a, a little bit of time the Lord gives you at the outset where things are going really quite well. But after that, what's happening to me? Why are all these things happening? Am I a Christian or not a Christian? Why is God afflicting me? Job asked the same question, didn't he? The reason why is because God is doing it for your good, to help you grow. And again, the point is because of God's good purpose behind this, that's why you can sing praises to Him, even in the worst situation, because you know the Lord has brought these things into your life for some good reason. That's why He is afflicting you. Let's not forget as well that God is God and we always owe it to Him regardless. I mean, Job knew that, which is why he worshiped Him. We should always worship Him because He is God. And let's not forget this too. When you're faced with a difficult situation and you want to go through it, well, you don't want to go through it, but you need to go through it, okay, for God's glory, the only way you're going to be able to do it is with His grace. But how do you get that grace? Well, you get it through the means of grace. One of the means of grace is worship. So when you're faced with a difficult situation, one of the best things you can do is sing praises to the Lord and look to Him in faith. That's how you receive the grace and the strength that you need to make it through it. And I'm sure that Jesus was doing precisely that. He's going to go out to pray and ask God for strength, but he was worshiping God as well. And that, too, would strengthen him. So he was worshiping God because he knew it was good that he was going to be afflicted. He was worshiping God because he is God. He was worshiping God because he knew through this he would gain strength. 
There's many reasons why we should always worship the Lord. But let me just close by saying this, and this is an application that we always need to make. You need to realize that everything we've just talked about, as far as what Jesus Christ has done, and the fact that because of that, God is going to give us <clears throat> not only salvation, but every good thing that comes to us, and that God even brings affliction and turns those things to uh, bring good things in our lives. That only applies if you're trusting in Jesus Christ. It doesn't apply to you if it doesn't, you see. If you're not trusting Jesus Christ, it's possible that those difficult times are meant to drive you to the Lord. Perhaps the Lord is using it for that purpose. There's other reasons why the Lord afflicts people too. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, that his wrath is being poured out every single day on the wicked and the unrighteous. They're going through difficult times because of their wickedness. It's not that God's going to bring good out of it. You see, this promise only applies to you if you're actually a believer, if you actually trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that Jesus is the only one who's able to take these situations and turn them around. God is a God of reversals. He is the one who can take the darkest situation and turn it as bright as day. Scripture says he's the one who turns, you know, flourishing, uh, you know, well, let's say an area that's flourishing into a desert or wilderness, and he's the one who can turn the wilderness back into a flourishing land. God is a God who has control over those things, absolute control. And he says he's going to do that for his people. He's the only one who can. So if you want to hold on to this particular promise, that all of these afflictions and difficulties are going to work together for your good, you have to come to Him. You have to trust Jesus. You have to turn from your sins. You have to walk with Him, and you have to do it from the heart. Now, I've already pointed out, that's not something that you can do in your own strength. That's something that God has to do supernaturally within you. Otherwise, you're going to continue to keep going the direction you're going your entire life and end up under God's judgment in the end. Only the Lord can change that direction, which is why you need to come to Him, which is why you need to look to Him and pray to Him to change your heart and to give you grace, to give you His Spirit, to make you able to believe, to turn your heart that by nature hates Him into one that loves Him. And by the way, the Lord is very gracious and He has saved many who have come to him and sought him for his mercy. So if you would hold on to this promise, if you would take hold of it to begin with, then you must first come to Christ. You must trust him. And you must be willing to do what Jesus said we must do if we are to be owned by him before the Father on that final day. You must be willing to confess him before men. You can't just be a secret Christian and keep your Christianity under a bushel somewhere, your light under a bushel and hidden from everyone else, you need to profess Christ openly. So may the Lord grant you the grace to do that, and may he grant to the rest of us who actually know the Lord purely by his mercies, that we might learn to praise him during even the most difficult circumstances, knowing that God brings difficult circumstances into our lives always, for some good reason. God is wise, infinitely wise. He knows how to bring good things into our lives, and the way he does it is always best. We might look at it and say, why has the Lord done this to me? But if we trust the Lord and we go through that, at the end we say, you know what? It was good that I was afflicted so that I may now obey the Lord the way that I should. I see now what he was doing. We need to learn to trust that what God says is true. It's good when we're afflicted so we can sing praises. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord in His mercy might help us to apply His Word. Remember, it doesn't do any good to hear it and even understand what it means if we're not willing to apply it. We need to remember it. We need to live it now that we've heard it. Our response when we face difficult times should be to worship the Lord, to praise Him. Let's, uh, let's spend a few moments now in prayer.